I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you today to this seminar of the program on U.S.-Japan relations, which today is co-sponsored with the Center for American Political Studies and the uh, Gunsberg Center for European Studies. Our speaker today uh, has been called by the Lundi, London Sunday Times uh, the most influential academic in the world today. Uh, <laughs> Calm down, calm down. <laughs> um, he is <coughs> the Peter and Isabel Malkin Professor of Public Policy based in the Kennedy School in a, and a professor in the Government Department uh, of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he received his <coughs> bachelor's degree from Swarthmore College, having grown up in Ohio and been a champion debater. He won the state championship in Ohio. Uh, <coughs> he then went on for his uh, PhD at Yale and he's had an extraordinarily distinguished career. Uh, and with, just to mention, the, really the books that have uh, been so important in his work, and which so many of you in this room are very familiar with, Making Democracy Work in 1994, uh, about civic traditions in modern Italy, his book Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community. He has also done a book, uh, I did a book with him on this uh, edited volume, Disaffected Democracies, What's Troubling the Trilateral Democracies, and a book in 2004, Better Together, Restoring the American Community. So <clears throat> he has a long background both in comparative politics and in more recently in American politics. He brings great distinction to both fields. Uh, and it is a, a privilege to bring him <coughs> here today to talk about a book that's just come out, American Grace, how Religion Divides Us and Unites Us, and which is the topic of his talk today, Bob Putnam. Susan, what a treat. Um, Susan didn't say that um, she and I have taught together a lot, and uh, that's one of, the, one of the great pleasures of my, uh, I'm a wanderer, I don't, I don't like to sit behind things, so I'm just gonna talk. Um, teaching with Susan has been one of the great delights of my time at Harvard, and uh, so I'm grateful to her for arranging this seminar, and to you all for coming. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is this new book, uh, American Grace. Um, there is nothing in it, or virtually nothing in it, about Japan or U.S.-Japan, Japanese relations. There's very little in it about Western Europe, um, although I am currently working with other people on a book that um, compares, uh, I guess I ought to turn my cell phone off, um, that compares uh, religion, the role of religion in the United States and in um, Western Europe, so I'm happy later on to talk about the questions of religion in uh, Western Europe, um, where it is uh, intimately bound up with questions of immigration. We're also doing research on immigration in Western Europe, so I'm, I'm trying to justify at least why we're in this room, um, but I, I, I'm very grateful to you for, um, for coming. Um, in Bowling Alone, the book Bowling Alone, which was about um, social capital in America, the social networks in America. I basically argued that um, all of America's social capital had been eroding pretty substantially over the past 30 or 40 years. Um, but uh, in the course of doing that, and I, and I talk about religion in that book, and indeed in that book said that as a rough rule of thumb, about half of all the social capital in America was religious. About half of all volunteering in America was religious, half of all philanthropy was religious, half of all the groups to which people belong in America, half of all of them are religious. That is, if you add up all the garden clubs and the bowling leagues and the Elks clubs and the scouts and trade unions and so on here, and then over here you have all the Bible reading groups and the, you know, the prayer groups and so on. Those two piles are as, this one is as high as that one. So it's a, it's a big deal. And I came gradually to think we had not devoted enough time to looking at the question of religion in America and how that has changed over the last 50 years. So we mean to have written, we hope to have written, um, <coughs> the most comprehensive and the most in-depth research on the United States, on the role of religion in American public life over the last half century. Um, and um, the book covers a lot of different things. It covers gender and religion and inequality in religion and um, lots and lots of things religion and the life cycle and so on, but I'm going to talk about the core um, puzzle about uh, religion in America. This is not a book um, about theology, so there's nothing in here about the content of religion, a little bit maybe, but not so much 
We're not talking about here about theologically what's been happening to Americans and whether we become more or less saintly. We're, we're trying to understand how the role of religion in American society has changed over the last 50 years. Um, and you will see that uh, really one of the first things I show you is that America is a very, very religious country. Uh, by any relevant standard, Americans are very devout compared to other countries in the world, certainly compared to other um, uh, advanced, economically advanced countries in the world. Um, and America is also deeply divided in religious terms. And over the last half century, we have become more and more polarized in religious terms. And partly, the first part of my talk will be about how we become, how it happens that we become much more polarized in religious terms over the last half century. So we're, we're religiously devout and religiously divided, and in most parts of the world, that's a prescription for mayhem. Um, if you think about the parts of the world that are high in religiosity and diverse in religiosity, uh, Belfast or, or Beirut or Baghdad or Bosnia or Bombay, um, uh, there's a strong correlation between diversity and religious diversity and, uh, uh, and, and religi religiosity on the one hand and, and um, homicidal mayhem on the other. That's sort of why some of the cr cr recent critics of religion, uh, like Christopher Hitchens, say religion poisons everything. Um, but actually, in the United States, we also turn out to be, and I'll need to offer you a lot of evidence of this, Americans are amazingly tolerant in religious terms. And I, 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 when I get to that part of the talk, I hope you'll agree with me. It's really quite breathtaking how tolerant Americans are. So the puzzle is, how could we be, how could Americans be these three things? Religiously devout, religiously diverse, and religiously tolerant. And that's sort of the puzzle. And then toward the end, if, I, if we have time, I'm going to get to a, another one of the themes of the book. It's, it's related to this question of how religion contributes to democracy in America. Um, it's some evidence in the book that religious people are actually nicer than other people, and I think that may be an interesting controversy, um, but I'll, that will be the third, third part of the talk. So I'm going to basically be talking about this, this central question of um, uh, Americans take religion in high doses. Religion taken in high doses is often toxic for a democratic community. Uh, how do we do it? Um, so. Let me see if I can do this upside down. Is that going to be the right direction? Oh, this is the right direction. OK, that's the puzzle. I've already, good, we've made this. Now I'm going to be, no, I'll just do it from here. Um, just a bit about uh, the research. We interviewed um, a very large sample, probably the largest, most comprehensive survey of religion and civic life in America ever done. 3,000 people we interviewed in 2006. We went back and interviewed the same people in 2007. That turns out to be methodologically actually quite important that we it's what's called a panel survey, so we can watch people, individual people, over time. And we actually, this in another month, we're going to go back and inter interview them a third time. We also then uh, double-checked our findings against um, all the other surveys we could find, and, we're, and our data, are, there's really not much discrepancy in the data between our findings and other people's findings. Um, and then finally, and, and in addition, we also did uh, Baker's dozen, about 12 or 13, uh, field studies in congreg religious congregations all across um, the United States um, uh, as a way of just trying to get, making sure that our quantitative numbers fit with what the impressions you'd have if you went and sat in the pews in various kinds of religious organizations and um, various kinds of religious communities in America. And America is very diverse. So we spent time in Saddleback, which is a very large evangelical megachurch in, in, in um, Orange County. You'll some of you will have heard of the pastor there. His name is Rick Warren. He's a quite visible evangelical preacher. And then we were in uh, Pioneer Ward, which is a um, uh, Mormon LDS uh, congregation in the suburbs of Salt Lake City. And we went to a couple of Episcopal churches in the, in the, in the Boston area, um, the, one of the oldest uh, uh, black churches in America, the, Af the Bethel AME in, in uh, Baltimore, some Ca uh, some uh, Catholic <coughs> parishes in Chicago and even a, a Jewish synagogue uh, just north of Chicago. So we spent a lot of time hanging out in these places to make sure we understood what the view from the pews looked like. Um, but I'm not going to basically be talking about the, uh, the story. The, they occupy a large part of the book. We have a whole 
set of chapters in which we talk about these particular places, what we call the vignettes of these places, but that's not what I'm going to talk about here today. Um, so, first of all, I had to show you, I have, to, you know, I have to establish three things, right, before I even get to the puzzle. I have to show that we're very diverse, rather very religious, and that we're very diverse, and then that, that we're very tolerant. That's the building block for this story. This is the only sh picture I'm going to show on the issue of the first question, which is how religious are we. This happens to be comparing different countries, the rate of religious observance, going to frequency of going to church, and the blue lines are um, for countries that are less developed. Um, so up at the top is Jordan. Um, of a Jordanian national sample, about 92% of people said they regularly went to religious services. And then Indonesia and Poland and Egypt and Brazil and India. And then the US, we're the red line. And then Iran. And then um, you know the gold or um, um, orange colored graphs are for, uh, for advanced industrial countries, um, Italy and Canada and Britain, and then way down at the bottom is Japan and Sweden, where about 7% of, well, I think it's about 7, maybe 5% of uh, Japanese, Swedes, and Swedes said that they went, that they go to religious services um, weekly. Um, notice where, where the U.S. stands. The average American is more religious, slightly more religious, than the average Iranian. Um, so I'm trying to give a sense of how religiously devout we are. This is for church attendance or attendance at religious services, but you get the same basic picture no matter what measure you use. It doesn't, none of this turns on exactly what measure you use. If you use questions like how important is religion in your daily life, again, America is very religious. So we're very religious. That's the first point I had to establish, uh, and I'm happy to come back and talk more about that, but um, I, the facts are, are pretty clear there. Um, now, these, these numbers of church attendance may be slightly, in fact, are, I'm sure, exaggerated because people everywhere slightly tend to exaggerate how, how often they do good things. Um, and um, so uh, if you uh, do go to church, uh, there are, as a rough rule of thumb, uh, um, probably the, over, the average level of religiosity is overstated in the United States by a, by a significant amount, probably by, uh, here it looks like the average American says 35%, but it's actually probably more like 25%. So if you go to church, there are more phantoms sitting beside you, that is people who think that they're there, or claim that they're there, but actually really aren't there. Um, but that, there's no, there's not much evidence that that degree of, of bias has been changing over time in the United States, and there's only a little bit of evidence that it's, that it's different between the United States and these other countries. So the basic story, um, is not much affected by the slight or modest exaggeration in church attendance or any other religiosity, features of our religiosity. Now, second point I want to talk about is how we become more polarized. So, uh, what I'm going to try to give you is a um, geological history of um, religiosity in America beginning in the 1950s. Um, any of you who've read uh, this earlier book called Bowling Alone, will gradually come to the suspicion that anything Putnam writes begins with this, opens in the 1950s, and that's always the high point of anything, whether we're talking about bowling leagues or churches, and it's been downhill since the 1950s. Um, and I live in fear that people are gonna say, well, all Putnam's work consists of is saying, actually, it's gotten worse since I've been around. Um, uh, but America, the reason, I pick, the reason we picked the 1950s as the starting point for this book is that the best evidence is that the 1950s was the most religious decade in American history. 60% um, of Americans told, 59% of Americans told Gallup in 1957 that they had been to church in the previous week. Nearly 60%. That's a way higher than it is now and way higher so far as we know that it had been true in earlier in American history. Church building, construction of churches was uh, by far an all-time peak in the 1950s. Um, sales of Bibles were an all time, by far more Bibles were sold in the 1950s than before or since. So it was a very religious epoch. And then, like a lightning bolt, comes the 1960s into American history. And much of American history, American popular social history, is deeply affected by the 1960s. Now I look around the room and I'm probably the only person in the room who actually even remembers the 1960s, but so I'm going to try to describe it to the rest of you. Um, it was a time of very rapid change, the 1960s were. Um, 
It was a time of questioning authority. That was a bumper sticker, questioned authority. And authority in all spheres of life was questioned. In politics, there was the uh, Vietnam War protest and, the, and Vietnam, I'm mean, sorry, and Watergate and so on. And in race relations, it was a time of the civil rights movement and, and, uh, and black liberation in, in gender terms. That was the, basically the beginning of the second women's revolution, the, the feminist revolution of the 1960s, which then has accelerated in the years since. Um, in every sphere of life, uh, the establishments were questioned, and that was uh, above all, or not above all, but certainly true in the area of religion. And so um, religion, religious observance dropped very rapidly in 10 years. Uh, the fraction of the American public, which had been about 60% who attended church, dropped by more than 10, 12, 14 percentage points, a huge de decline almost overnight. But most interestingly, it was the 1960s was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Do you all, do you all even know what I mean when I say rock and roll? I want to make sure <laughs> we've got, we're dealing with culturally competence here, cultural competence here. And you know about drugs, and you know about sex. Um, well, all those were changing very rapidly. Um, and indeed, basic norms of, around, about uh, sexual behavior changed at an almost literally inconceivable um, uh, rate. Maybe could you folks move, move over just that way a little bit? Thank you. Um, it's hard. I, I can't <coughs> convey to you how rapidly uh, norms about basic sexual uh, behavior change. Um, th we know a little bit about this because um, Gallup was asking. There's good data actually on this on the one point that I'm going to mention, which is uh, whether premarital sex, having sex before marriage or outside of marriage, but especially before marriage, was moral or not. And uh, before the 1960s, and among people who had come of age before the 1960s, there was an overwhelming um, view, it was not even questioned actually, that sex before marriage was morally wrong. 85% 80, of Americans in the population in the 1950s said that. But into that population came a group of young people just coming of age, the baby boomers, 80% of them said premarital sex is fine. Um, and that caused the overall average, the, in the population as a whole, it's hard to move measures like the ones that I'm talking about. The fraction of all Americans who said that um, premarital sex was OK in moral terms doubled in about six years. That's a huge change. And it happened very quickly. And I happen to remember personally how, when it happened, how rapidly it happened, because I happen to have been in college in the early 1960s, I graduated from college in 1963. And um, in my senior year uh, at college, it was a very liberal college, very progressive college, the rules about when men and women could be um, together in the same room alone were very clear. It had to be between 2 o'clock and 6 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. I guess we were thought to be in a state of moral grace um, on Sunday afternoon. And the door had to be open. <coughs> and three of the four feet in the room had to be on the floor. Um, <laughs> it was called the three-foot rule. Um, and you'd have to be really a contortionist and an exhibitionist under those circumstances <laughs> to, to imagine having, doing anything but having a conversation about um, Keats or, um, uh, or astronomy or something. Um, and that was the, there was a little bit of debate about how wide, how far open the door had to be. But that was the rule. Um, three years later, in the same college, um, the, there were not just co-ed dorms, but co-ed rooms. <coughs> and the rooms, the doors were all closed. And I, they were closed, doors were closed, and I was not there. So I can't say what was going on behind the closed doors. But I'm guessing it was not Keats <coughs> and, and astronomy. And that happened nationwide in just a couple of years, two or three years. So it happens that all across America right now, there's a generation of men who are my age, exactly my age, who've gone through their whole life thinking, if only I'd been born three years later. <laughs> um, so there was this very, very rapid transformation in sexual morality. And most young Americans um, experience, I'm sure there's a different background slide I should be having up here. Um, this is the 1950s, and that's the 1960s. Uh, in 1959, we were all going to church in our little two-by-two two families. Uh, 1966, Time Magazine had a, a famous uh, cover saying, Is God Dead? Um, and um, 
in, in many areas, um, by many people, especially younger people, this transformation of America was, um, was, was experienced as liberation, uh, sexual liberation and liberation in general. And so, and associated with that was that those same people, exactly the same people, um, stopped going to church. And therefore, in religious terms, it was like an earthquake, which then sent a huge fraction of the youngest people in America, and a significant fraction of all Americans, off in the secular direction. I'm going to have the, this end of the room. It's going to be the secular end of the room the, uh, today. I don't, I'm not casting aspersions on your views. You may or may not be secular, but this is what this end is going to be. So earthquake, shock, sends a lot of people off to this end. And they thought that was, they people at this end thought that was just great. But at the same time, there were another group of Americans who didn't, who, who observed the same trends, but experienced them not as liberation, but as a collapse of the four fundamental precepts of American civilization. I'm not exaggerating. They, their view was, for 2,000 years, we've had a set of rules and institutions and understandings, and that's just, in a flick of an eye, we've just done away with that, and that's morally wrong. And it shows up in a lot of things, in premarital sex, in, in family values, that was they called it. And those people, in the 1970s and 1980s, moved off in a more religious direction, became more religious, and they went to the part of the religious spectrum where the voices were clearest in defending traditional family and moral values. And that became the rise of evangelical, uh, the Protestant evangelicalism, because that's, those were the, those were the trump trumpets that were the sounding the loudest <coughs> in religious terms, and those folks came to that, gathered around that banner. It was not initially a political movement. Initially, it was, you might say, a moral movement or a religious movement, but it was not initially a political movement. <coughs> but once they were here, and they were you know, in known locations on Sunday, um, a number of politicians said, hey, that's a, that's a marketing opportunity, and so a number of, of Rep Republican conservative politicians began crafting their appeals to this new group, and over the course of the 70s and 80s, that group became the religious right. So this is where, the, and, and that created, you know, the culture wars and a lot of which you're familiar with. So that sounds, from their point of view, that was great, and they at last believed that they were now having a chance to not to dominate the whole society, but to pressure the society to move in the direction of the values that they felt and that they also felt strongly were the kind of, that's the way we always had had it as a country in, in, in moral and, and political terms. So that was an aftershock. So the first shock, remember, is the, the, the shock of the 60s, and which sends a one group of people over in that direction. And the aftershock is the 70s and 80s, which sends another group of people off in this more religious direction, and you can see what's happening is that the, in, as a result of these things, the middle is kind of all hollowing out here. And then, um, in the, in, I'll show you some pictures in just a second. Of, uh, I just want to give you, make sure you got the narrative right. Um, but the world did not end there. So beginning in the 1990s, the people, Americans who were coming of age in the 1990s, um, uh, for them, uh, religion seemed to be about politics, basically. I mean, the only thing they ever heard about in poli and they heard about Jerry Falwell and the religious right, and that's what seemed what religion is. And this group of young people, the ones who came of age after the 1990s, after 1990, during the 1990s and 2000s, produced a second aftershock, which sent yet another group of people off in the secular direction. And this second, this second aftershock is most no the most notable feature of it is that larger and larger numbers of young people began to say that they, were, they had no religion at all. So there's a standard question that's been asked by Gallup and other people for 70 years. Um, uh, what, you, what, in, what, is, in, what is your religious preference? Are you Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or Baptist or you know, Episcopalian or whatever? Or nothing in particular. That is, are you none of the above? Just not religious, not none of the above. And there was a standard, flat, forever, 5 to 7% of Americans had said they were nuns. They were, I don't mean nuns in the sense of Catholic sisters. I mean that they had no religious affiliation. Just, it was a little known constant. It was called Putnam's Constant. Putnam's Constant was there would be 5 to 7% of the population that had, were, had no religious affiliation. Until 1990. 
And then beginning in 1990, like a hockey stick, if you know a hockey stick has this shape, you'll see in a second, the graph just looks just like this. And so today, 17 to 18% of Americans say they have no religion, but that change was entirely concentrated among young people. So among people who are 20 somethings in America, that figure is probably 27, 28, heading toward 30% of, that's just a huge number. I, I don't know if you can see that that, that the long run implication of that trend is enormous because those people who are all of Americans who are 20 somethings now are starting their life cycle, their career, their adult lives at a level of religiosity which is an order of magnitude lower than any previous generation in America. Now, over the course of their lifetime, they will almost certainly become somewhat more religious themselves. Uh, because there's a very well understood life cycle pattern. I can describe it to you briefly. Uh, we are, almost all of us are at our low point in terms of religiosity, in going to church or believing in God or whatever. The low point in uh, when we're in college. And then that, it rises significantly when you have kids and, and get married and settle down. You know, people start becoming a little more religiously involved almost all the time. It rises, it's basically in the early 30s, there's an upturn. And there's a long period from how when you're in your 30s out to when you're in about your 60s, which is more or less stable. And then it begins to rise. And from your 60s, 70s, and 80s, people are becoming more and more religious. Now, I don't know quite why that, nobody knows quite why there's that rise at, at the end. My theory is nearer my God to thee. Um, <laughs> you begin to cover your bets. You think, well, maybe there's something to this. And maybe I'll just start earning some more points um, as I approach death. Um, but, and so, and I think it's very likely that the current 20-somethings will follow that same pattern, you know, the kind of 30s rise and then the 60s, 70s rise. But they're beginning that process. You see this at a very lower level of, of a much lower level of religiosity. And that means that in, in religion, as in, as in Pepsi and Coke, all of the, all of the action in terms of getting customers comes among people who are in their teens and 20s because people tend to form their views about Pepsi or Coke when they're in their 20s. And Pepsi marketers, or cola marketers, marketers in general actually, focus extremely heavily on very young people because they know if they, that that's where the action is. Once, they're, once they've got them then, they're gonna continue like that. And so in the, this change in religious patterns among young people in America between 1990 and, and today, um, if that had happened to Coca-Cola, the CEO of Coke would be, I assure you, out on his ear. Because it's a, it would be a disaster for cola to discover that they suddenly were losing the youth market because of its long run implications. Um, so that's the second aftershock. Now what you see, of course, is, I hope you see that the aggregate effect of this is we send some people off in this direction, then some people off in this direction, then other people off in this direction. And what's happening is, in the middle, there are fewer and fewer people. There are more. So the average level of religiosity in America has not changed much over this period, but that's because We've been, some of us are becoming more religious and others of us be, have becoming less religious over this period. Um, I want to show you a few pictures. Oh, well the other thing I have to tell you is we've become more polarized in the second sense. That is, there's becomes, there has come to be a closer and closer connection between how often we go to church or religious services and how we vote. Now that was, if you've lived in this period, you think, well of course, dummy religious people are going to vote more conservative. But that was not true. It was factually not true in American history. In American history, religious people were often the most progressive people in America. So most of the major progressive political social movements in America had deep religious roots. The egalitarian part of the American Revolution was founded, it was founded, was based on a, um, a evangelical revival in America in the, in the 18th century. Uh, the first great awakening was called, and without that, we would not have our, our revolution would not have been so egalitarian. The second, the uh, uh, the white um, emancipation movement, the white um, anti-slavery movement in the in the uh, middle of the 19th century, was rooted very directly in um, uh, the uh, in the second evangelical, the second great awakening, the evangelical movement that swept across uh, the North in in the 1830s. And so things that you think of as religious, right? You know about the altar call. Some, if you know a little bit about, call, about American culture, you know that the, this is a feature of American evangelicals. The altar call is when the preacher says, if you're ready to be saved, come up, come up to the altar. 
And then, you know, a sinner sitting out there, I don't mean you're a sinner, but you kind of <laughs> get overwhelmed by my, by the religious fervor, and you come up and I put my hands on you and you're saved. That, that technique was invented by Charles Finney, who was the leading, leading um, uh, evangelical, evangelist, evangelist of this period, as a way of compiling a mailing list for the <laughs> uh, abolition movement. No, I'm not, I mean, that's, he had people come up so that the, he could get them to sign their names so that he could then put them on a mailing list, like an email list, right, for joining the, 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 um, the uh, abolitionist movement. Um, so there's a deep interconnection. I'm getting a little bit off the subject, except to say, but another example that you're maybe a little more familiar with, the, ci the civil rights movement in the United States was founded in black churches and white churches. So it's not true historically that America's religious people were a people of the uh, right. They were, if anything, people of the left. Um, but then, and that was even as recently as the 1960s and 1970s, there were plenty of Democrat, <coughs> progressive Democrats sitting in the pews on Sunday morning. Now, there are a lot more of them in black churches because the black community is very religious and also very progressive. But even among white, there were many, many white progressives in church on Sunday morning in the 60s and even into the 1970s. But then, and there were also lots of unchurched conservatives, lots of conservative people who were not at church. But what happens during the course of the 70s and 80s and 90s, this period that I was describing, is that wh where you, how often you go to church turns can become more, more closely connected with how you vote. Um, and this is just the correlation coefficient between how often you go to church and whether you're a Republican or not. And you can see, I don't know if you can see there, it's, it's sort of low. And in that period, in the late 60s, actually, people who were at church were more likely to vote Democratic than re vote Republican. Um, or Republicans were less likely to go to church than Democrats. But then, beginning, you can see here, beginning, it begins to rise during the first and second aftershocks. And then with the third aftershock, it just takes off. Uh, and that's the so-called God gap. Um, this, um, the, the, now, the fact is that people who go to church a lot are way more likely to be Republican. So that's yet another sense of polarization. Do you see what I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is we become more polarized, a lot more polarized over these last uh, 30 or 40 years. Par partly more polarized in the sense that more of us are at the polls, either very religious or very not religious. And more, that turns in turn is more closely connected to politics, way more closely than it used to be. Um, so let me show you just a, a, a couple of, well, let me just pause for just one second, because this, this is, this next point may be a little bit of a surprise, it was a shock to us. One thing that is implicit in what I've just finished saying is that people are adjusting their politics in the, to fit their religion, or adjusting their religion to fit their politics. More and more people have consistent views in religious and political terms, right? There are more and more, you can predict whether someone's going to be religious or not religious by their politics or vice versa. So we have fewer and fewer church-going progressives in America and fewer and fewer unchurched conservatives. So here's the question. When people are in that, in that anomalous situation, they're in one of those two boxes, either they're religious and progressive or they're unreligious and conservative, what do they change? Because that shows they're changing. What do they change? Do they change their politics to fit their religion, or do they change their religion to fit their politics? Religion. Pardon? Change the religion to fit the politics. Yeah, that's, I didn't believe that, actually. I was certain that could not be, you know, we, our data showed that, but I couldn't, but I just could not believe it, because I said to myself, remember, this is still at stake here. If you're a believer, what's at stake is your eternal fate. And that goes on for a long time. <laughs> so even with a discount rate, it's going to be, you know, a lot depends, and I couldn't believe that people would be making decisions with that import about their permanent, you know, their fate based on how they felt about, you know, Bill Clinton or George W. Bush. It just didn't seem to me to add it up. People, and I thought people would be going to church, they'd be hearing the sermons, they'd be becoming more conservative, or they'd be not at church, they wouldn't hear the sermons, therefore they would become more progressive. But no, you're right. Most people are changing their religion to fit their politics. Um, so that's another way in which we become more polarized over this period. Um, and I want to show you just a one, a couple more pictures just quickly, because I think you'll find them striking. Um, this looks only at young people, because as I said, young people is where the action is. And this looks only at 20-somethings over the period from 1970 to 2010. The um, gold line there, the upper line there, 
um, shows what fraction of all young people in America are evangelicals. And you can see it rose quite quickly from the, from about the mid 1970s to the middle 90s. That's the first, you're looking there at the first aftershock, right, as more and more young people move into evangelical churches. And here's this, this period here is, these are the fraction of all people who say they have no religion. Those are the young nuns, again, not Catholic sisters, but the N-O-N-E-S. So here's the period of Putnam's constant, right? No, no, not that many people, and it's going down a little bit. There's 1990. You can see visibly the second aftershock. You can look at it. You can see the second aftershock, right? Because all of a sudden, um, people start um, uh, saying, young people start saying they have no religion, and stop saying they're evangelical Protestants. In 1990, the peak of the evangelical movement, um, there were twice as many young evangelicals as young nuns, and now there are approaching twice as many young nuns as there are young evangelicals. Um, and these lines, so far as we can tell, are continuing to, to move in those, in those directions. And it's not accidental that that is, um, that is, if I go back to the previous graph, that you'll see it's exactly, the timing is exactly the same. That's when the polarization started to take off, right? You see that 1990 is when the polarization, and if you then unpeel this further, I'm not gonna uh, bore you with a lot of statistics, who are those people who stopped being evangelicals and started being uh, young nuns? What would predict who was going to be a young nun? And it's entirely about uh, their politics and especially, above all, how they feel about homosexuality. During this is a period when young people were becoming more, much more tolerant of homosexuality, very sharp in generational increase beginning in 1990 in tolerance for homosexuality among young people. So the young people were zigging to the left on homosexuality issues. At the same time, the religious, the most visible religious people were zagging to the right, right? They were having all these, these public campaigns against gay marriage and so on and referendum and so on. And so the young people went in this direction, the religious people went in this direction, and the young people did not follow them, but they went right out of church. And so that's the best predictor. These, these young nuns, by the way, they're not atheists. Or I won't say they're not atheists. A few of them say they don't believe in God. Most of them say they believe in God. Most of them say they pray. Some of them actually go to church. Um, many of them say religion is important to them. So they're not opposed to religion in general, and they're certainly not atheists. A lot of the atheist groups in America take credit for them as, as if they were atheists, but they're not. They say they believe in God. What they are is very alienated from organized religion because for them, growing up when they did, what religion seemed to be about was Jerry Falwell, that was not them. Homophobia, that was not them. So they're, they're out looking. Nobody's appealing to them. Now, if we, if we had more time, I'd pause and say, actually, I think that that's not a stable equilibrium. I think that what will very likely happen in the very near future, meaning in the next five to 10 years, is those trends will change because there will be, not because kids will change, but because there will be new kinds of religion that come to be on offer. I, it'll be Christian. I don't mean some other you know, new agey kind of thing. I just mean. Um, a lot of, of you know, megachurches and so on will stop leading with the politics because it's the politics that drove the kids out of church. And I was going to use a market metaphor. There's a niche here. There's a pool of people here who are, so, from a religious point of view, souls to be saved. I mean, let me, use, let me not use marketing. Let me use uh, Jesus Christ's words. He said to his disciples, that to, he urged them to be fishers of men, F-I-S-H-E-R, anglers of men. That's what he said. Here's a pool, lots of fish in it. You can see that's, that, that, there are a lot of fish in this pool. Nobody's fishing there. I'm certain somebody, some religious entrepreneur is going to head, that, head there. Um, so I, think, I don't think this is going to go on forever in this direction, but this is what's been happening so far. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, I'm going to skip that just because it's a, it's a pretty graph, but I, I said everything's on it. Um, oops, sorry. Um, can I pause for a second? Um, you all knew that I was a college student. No. <laughs> if it's really, really short. Yeah. Are all Protestants evangelical? No. Or no, no. Non-mainstream Protestants. Well, is there's a mainstream. Who are they? Could you name them? Sure. Um, there's a very. This is a very well. Um, I, there's. It's. There's a been a lot of debate about this. There's a scholarly consensus about how to identify evangelicals from. They're basically, all Protestants in America now are divided into 
main, main line Protestants and evangelical Protestants. And that the underlying distinction goes back to the beginning of the 20th century with the modernist controversy. Well, the other I, what are they called? Deities? No, no, no. I mean, uh, I, New the, age I'm going to tell you. Just let me finish. <laughs> um, it's Baptists. It's um, uh, uh, it's not. They're not New Age. They're basically even. There are various flavors of evangelical um, uh, uh, churches, or the, some of them are non-denominational. There's a list basically that is not. We didn't create. We just put our people into their one of these categories by by their what denomination or non-denomination they belong to, and they are very distinctive. And the main line are the, are the, Protest, are the Protestant denominations, basically that, you'll, that many of you will have heard of, that is, it's the kind of Methodists and Presbyterians and Lutherans and, and uh, Episcopalians, and I think I've got the main ones, Unitarian, uh, not Unitarians, um, uh, Church of Christ. Um, they're basically, those are the old main line Protestant churches, which used to be, actually, let me show, I will show you, because we got it right here. Um, this is a parfait cup with the different levels here being different religious families. And so these are the fraction of all Americans who belong to one of the denominations or churches that is uh, commonly identified as evangelical. And, um, and you can see the first aftershock, the number of evangelicals in America, the number of people attending evangelical churches rises from 23% to 28%. That's, that is the Boom, it's a real change, but that's all it was. It was from 23% of all Americans to 28% of Americans becoming evangelical Protestants. It ends, the, bo the evangelical boom ends in the 90s. It's now 20 years old. The rise of evangelical in America is very, very old news. It stopped 20 years ago. And they're now down to 24% of Americans, which is about where they started. So it's basically over. Um, the red uh, pattern here is for mainline Protestants. That's people who were members of, or say they're members of, Methodists and Lutherans and, and uh, Episcopalians and so on. As you can see, back if you, if we could extend this graph back in American history, that was by far the dominant. That was really what normal, normal Americans were in those. And that group, that group is now very rapidly disappearing. It's gone from about 20, basically 25% of Americans in the 1970s down to about 12% of Americans. And they are all old. They're all my age. And so it's, uh, uh, sadly, I mean, I, I was actually raised as a Methodist, so I don't feel say this with any glee, but that those mainline Protestant churches are, it will take a miracle. I mean, maybe that's what they specialize in, but it will take a <laughs> real, a real miracle to, to change the, their fate. The green is Catholics. Let me just, just say a word about Catholics because it is an interesting story. Um, the Catholic Church, the kind of ordinary Catholic Church in America, people who were raised as Catholics in America, Two-thirds two -thirds of them are no longer practicing Catholics. Two, I say that again. Two-thirds of all Americans who are raised as Catholics are no longer practicing Catholic. One-third of them actually don't even say they're Catholic, and one-third of them still say they're Catholic, but it's like they're culinary Catholics. They never go to Mass. They don't belong to any parish. They never attend. That's when they, they, only, they say they're Catholic when you ask them, but actually it's, it's like saying they're Irish or something. It's a, it's not, it doesn't describe their religion. Um, so two-thirds of them, so huge numbers of, of, um, of, of ordinary white Catholics have been leaving the Catholic Church in droves for 30 years, rushing out one door. Meanwhile, the total number of Catholics has remained constant in America. How could that possibly be? Because in another door of the church are rushing millions of Latinos. And so the Catholic Church is benefited from, it's, the whole the crisis of the Catholic Church has been covered up by the fact that they're getting huge new waves of immigrants who are almost all Catholic. And, but this is changing the Catholic Church unbelievably dramatically fast. I mean, it's, 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 it's not the main story today, but it's a very, very interesting story. The Catholic Church overnight is moving from being an Irish, Italian, Polish institution to being a Mexican, Latino institution. So that of all the Catholics in their 30s who sat in mass last Sunday, of all, of all over America, not just in LA or something, but all over America, all the Catholic, all the 30 something, 20 something Catholics in America, two thirds speak Spanish, not English. That's now. And, that, and so therefore, that's gonna, you can see how rapidly, almost overnight, the rest of us ought to be thankful for the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church is the only institution of mainline America which is in touch with these immigrants. So it's great for the rest of us that the church, Catholic Church is doing the same thing it did 100 years ago, being the front porch of America for immigrants. But 
from the point of view of the church, it's an enormous challenge. Their hierarchy is still 90% Irish, and they're dealing with a very a, a group of people who are very different, not just in their skin color, actually, maybe not in their skin color, but in their liturgy. You know, they're going to be more mari mariachi bands in church and in the saints they believe in. Uh, Maria of Chestahova is out because their poles are down, but the, you know, the our Virgin of Guadalupe is going to be up. There's going to be huge changes in the Catholic Church. That is hidden behind that, uh, the green there. Um, and then up at the top you see the growth of the nuns. That's the 7%, 7%, and then suddenly 17%, but it, it's, as I say, because we're doing it rap quite rapidly. Okay. Um, you probably more than want to know. Um, oh, no, so now I go back. Sorry. This is where I was before the question got asked about evangelicals. Thank you for the question. Um, did anybody come here today not knowing that I was a professor? If you arrived in this room and thought that you were going to hear an architect or a or a preacher or something, raise your hand. How many of you? So the rest of you all knew you were getting a professor when you came here, right? And you all knew that professors give quizzes. Did you have any reason to doubt the professors give quizzes? No. So uh, this was not a pop quiz. You had, uh, you had totally fair warning, and here's the quiz. I'm going to give you, ask you a question that, was, that we asked all of our American respondents. A very simple question. How often do you say grace? Saying grace means saying a blessing before a meal. You know what I, do you all know what I mean by saying grace? That is, you know, saying some kind of religious uh, blessing before a meal. We ask our people, do you say that all the time, basically? I mean, almost every day you say grace before one meal at least? Or do you basically never say grace? Grace is not part of your cultural vocabulary. I mean, maybe once with the family on Thanksgiving or something, but basically not grace saying. Or are you kind of in the middle? You know, you do it occasionally, but, but not all that often. So I want to see your, I want to have a raise, raise your hands on respect to that question. Do you always say grace, never say grace, or sometimes say grace? And where always means basically mostly every day, and, and never means, doesn't literally mean never, never, ever, but very rarely. Um, uh, but and I'm, I'm not taking names, so I won't be keeping track of your answers. And if you feel embarrassed, you can put your head down and raise your hand. Um, so um, can I see the hands of the grace sayers, please? The people who say grace. Okay. Good. Great. Can I see the hands of the non-grace sayers, please? All right. That's maybe what I expected, although you'll see in a minute. A slight surprise. Can I see the hands of the people who are in the middle? They sometimes say it, but not. Okay. Um, well, actually, you just told me. You didn't know this, but you told me a lot about yourself. I now know from how you raise your hands, I know a lot about who you voted for. I know a lot about your views on a many, many social issues. Um, there's a lot you've told me about yourself. I will not repeat it, and I wasn't taking names, so I don't want you to think I'm going <laughs> to. Uh, but grace saying turns out to be a very strong predictor of a ton of things. Now, it's not a perfect predictor, so if you are, let's say, pro-choice, and you nevertheless say grace all the time, don't come up to me afterwards and say, and say, I'd say grace, but I'm pro-choice. Because I, I know there are three of you in America who are in that category. <laughs> and I'm glad to have you here today. Um, but, but let me show you what the figures look like for, on that question look like for America as a whole. 46% um, of Americans never, occasionally or never say grace. 44% of Americans say grace daily or more often. And 10% of us say grace, you know, Sometimes, but not others. Um, I've never seen a, a graph look like that. Actually, it's, a, it's basically it's not a normal graph. I mean, in the you know normal means we know what a normal curve looks like, right? In the middle, and not many of the extremes. And that graph captures how America has become polarized. We become more and more polarized into the gray sayers and the non-gray sayers. Um, and by the way, if you were glancing around the room at this room, you you'll be able to tell why that this audience is not a typical American uh, audience. I'm not talking about the nationality. I'm talking about uh, this is a way, way, way more secular audience, not than, than Cambridge. Cambridge is actually probably one of the most secular places in America. I don't mean un, unholy or, or evil. I just mean secular places. But um, if we did the nationwide numbers, it looked like that. Um, so those of you who were grace sayers in the room, I want you to know in the wider community, you have lots of support. We just don't have much support in this in this room. I'm <laughs> um, 
So, whoops, sorry, wrong direction. And yet we're very tolerant. And this is the second part of the story that I want to tell. Ameri Americans are amazingly tolerant. So let me just show you some quick uh, other survey data. Um, we asked people, first of all, we wanted to know how, how tolerant religious people were of non-religious people. So we asked all of our people, um, would you say that a person who has no religious faith, has no religious faith, can nevertheless be a good American, a perfectly good American? And here's the answers to that question. Um, oh, sorry. Actually, I, I, I'm going to get to that question in a second. Let me, let me, this is in a way even more in, intriguing graph. If you'll stick with me for a minute. We ask everybody in our, in our society to say, in our sample to say how they felt about every other religion in America. So we ask everybody how you feel about Catholics and Protestants and Jews and mainline Protestants and Mormons and Muslims and Buddhists and so on. And then we, when we know what they are, so we're, we wanted to sort of say, how does every group fare in the views, among the views of people who are not in that group? So how do non-Catholics feel about Catholics? How do non-Muslims feel about Muslims and so on? And the vertical axis here is this feeling thermometer. So up toward the top means people who aren't that like them. And down at the bottom means people who aren't like, aren't, aren't that, don't like them. So you won't be surprised to find that the most popular religious group in America are Jews, followed by Catholics and mainline Protestants up there. There's the mainline Protestants. And then evangelical Protestants and non-religious people, and then Mormons, Buddhists, and Muslims. Let's pause up there. Um, you should be shocked not to say incredulous that the, the most popular religious groups in America are uh, Jews and Catholics. If we had done this survey 100 years ago, I assure you that would not have been true. <laughs> and most Jews are certain it isn't true. So I happen to be Jewish, and I gave a, this basically this talk to my own congregation in Lexington a couple of years ago. And people loved this. You know, they're kind of a favorite son. They love me, and they love the work I'm doing on religion and so on. They think it's terrific. But Bob, th that data is just wrong. They do hate us. Um, and yet the data, our data, not any other data shows the same thing. And Catholics also used to be the, one of the most hated groups in America. And now they're really popular. So that's a big change. Catholics and Jews are very popular. Mainliners are up there too because they kind of feel, you know, that's Methodists who could be upset about our Lutherans or something. Who could be upset about them? That's kind of like, um, you know, uh, uh, Lake Wobegon um, <laughs> country. Evangelical Protestants and the non-religious, remember, these are the two poles in the, soci in the society that I described, the evangelical Protestants over there and the, and the people who say they don't have any religion over here. They're both a little less popular, but they're, so they're below the average for all groups, but they're actually above 50%, which means, uh, the 50-50 line, which means people who are not evangelicals and people who are not religious people feel kind of neutral about them. They don't hate them. They're just kind of neutral. And then we come down to Mormons, which you might not be surprised, of, which you might not be surprised about, and then Muslim, Buddhists, Buddhists and Muslims. So there's been a lot of talk about anti-Muslim feeling in America, which is true, and our graph shows that. And we all know why that's true, right? It's terrorism. Uh, and that's also the same reason why Americans feel almost as e bad toward Buddhists as they do toward Muslims. It must be there's a lot of Buddhist terrorism. <laughs> Wrong, right? Can't possibly be. I mean, how, when was the last? Huh? They're, they're patent. So it can't be that people are upset about Buddhists because they're because of Buddhist terrorism. I mean, it's, I, I don't think that behind Al-Qaeda there's some big Buddha. It turns out Al-Qaeda Al is, uh, is a front, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden is a front man for Buddhism or something. No, it's because the reason people are unhappy about Buddhists, average, the average American is unhappy about Buddhists, is they don't know anybody who's Buddhist. That is, it's just a very foreign sounding religion. But if that's true for Buddhism, it must also be true for Muslims. So the fact that there's a whole lot of anti-Muslim feeling in America is not driven by terrorism. It's driven by strangeness. And Mormons also sort of fit in that same category. Um, uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. Let me, the, the one thing I want to basically convey is, though, basically every group, every religious group in America, with the minor exception of the, the Muslims and Buddhists and Mormons, are liked by the rest of the country. They're all up above 50%. And if you think that's, you know, not impressed by that, I should tell you what that, what, if I put on the chart how Democrats feel about Republicans and how Republicans feel about Democrats, like I, we, did, we asked that question so I can tell you where it is. I want to show you where the, the Democrat rate, Democratic people who are themselves Democrats rate Republicans here <laughs> and Republicans rate Democrats here. <laughs> so we're way more polarized, way more polarized in political terms and less tolerant and less open-minded about 
our political opponents, then we are, we're actually pretty open-minded about our religious opponents. They're not even opponents. Um, now, I said, this is a question I started about before. Would you say that a person who has no religious faith could nevertheless be a good America, American? And the, the, the vertical axis, sorry, the horizontal axis is how religious or secular the person we're talking to is, right? So here we have the most secular people in America, of whom 98% say seculars are, could be good Americans. That's not surprising. But this is surprising. These are the most religious Americans. These are the, the people who go to church twice a week. And 82% of them say a person without faith can be nevertheless be a good American. Um, there are many other questions that we ask that have the same basic uh, pattern. I'm going to show uh, something of them. Um, we ask, would you, how do you feel about is diversity, religious diversity, been good for America? Now, the Taliban answer to that, we know. We know the Taliban do not think religious, religious diversity would be great for Afghanistan. Um, and it's probably not surprising that the most secular Americans, 84% of them, say that religious diversity is good for America. But it might be surprising that the most religious Americans, 74% of them, say that diversity is diverse, religious diversity is good for America. 74% of them say it's good for America to have different kind of religions. So lots of loose talk about how we have these American Taliban's, the, the evangelical right, who are intolerant. That isn't true. They are not Taliban-like. They don't want to impose a single religion on America. They're surprisingly, I don't want to say that they're saints. I'm not trying to say that, but I'm trying to say, since this is a room that has more secularists, if I were in a room that had more evangelicals, as I have been over the course of the last several months, I would try to be saying, secular Americans actually do not hate you. And when I'm in a room of seculars, I try to say, actually, religious Americans do not hate you. Um, and, and they believe religious diversity is good. We ask a sort of a standard question you know, it's been asked actually in other countries too. Um, can a good person, not of your faith, go to heaven or be saved? We ask that of everybody in America. Now, of course, the question only makes sense if you believe in heaven, but that's not a big hurdle in America. The vast majority of Americans, over 90%, say they believe in heaven. Actually, more Americans say they believe in heaven than believe in life after death. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. <laughs> What do they have in mind? <laughs> but OK, so it's not a big hurdle. If you ask people, would you say that people not of your faith, a good person not of your faith, can be saved? And overwhelmingly, 96% of mainline Protestants say that people in other religions can be saved, can go to heaven. 95% of Jews, 93% of Catholics, 90% of black Protestants, 90% of people in other faith, 83% of evangelical Protestants. Now, it's true evangelical Protestants are a little more um, kind of have a little bit more of a four members only view about heaven, but still 83% of American evangelical Protestants say you don't have to be of their faith to be to get to heaven. Um, well, and then we thought, oh, gosh, sure, that, they, that they're pro that's probably Baptists saying that one or two Methodists are going to be able to get into heaven. <laughs> and that wasn't quite what we wanted. So then we said, if someone said to us, anybody said to us, that a good person not of their faith can get into heaven, uh, that is, Christians, we said, do you mean non-Christians? Are you sure that you mean that? Would you say that non-Christians can get into heaven? And even, even when we ask the question in that way, we repeat the question and we kind of push it to make sure they get it, still 83% of Catholics, 79% of mainline Protestants, even a majority of evangelical Protestants, a majority of evangelical Protestants say you do not have to be Christian to be saved. That is the wrong answer. <laughs> the, Jesus is very clear about this. No, I mean, he, you know, uh, it's, I mean, he's a very nice guy, but my way or the highway. He said, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the light, except through me there is no access to the Father. It's very clear what the right answer is. But a, a majority of evangelical Protestants and an overwhelming majority of other Christians in America do not, they get that answer wrong. How could that be? I had a really interesting experience because I was giving this talk to the annual theological uh, conference of American of Missouri Synod Lutherans. Missouri Synod Lutherans are the most, uh, most conservative religious group in America, probably. And these were the theologians, and they love the talk, actually. They especially like the part that I'm going to get to later about how religious people are nicer. They thought that was right. <laughs> um, but I got to this point, and there they, it was, it was astonishing. Uh, they said, that just, that's terrible. I can't, how did all those other evangelicals get misled? How could they possibly believe that you can get to heaven except through Christ. 
And then the guy, the commentator said, oh, you know, thank God for the, the Missouri Synod Lutherans. Our folks know the right answer to that question. And I had my laptop, this very laptop with me, and I had the data on the laptop. So in real time, I did some data analysis. Because we had a lot of Missouri Synod Lutherans in our sample. And it turns out that most Missouri Synod Lutherans in the pews think you don't have to be Christian to be saved. And I, of course, like any good social scientist, reported that to the theologians. Deep gloom <laughs> envelops the room because they said, we're failures. We've not, we've not conveyed to our people. Actually, the same question asked of, of uh, pe preachers across America. The preachers get the answer right. <laughs> they 100% of all evangelical pastors in this, in the, in, not in our survey, but in another survey, 100% say, no, non-Christians can't make it. Nice people, but just not going to make it to heaven. So how did all the people in the pews get it wrong? That's a puzzle. Um, and the answer, solving the answer to that puzzle, I'm going to solve that puzzle for you right now, but solving it turns out to be the key to understanding this basic puzzle. How could Americans be religiously uh, devout, religiously diverse, and nevertheless religiously tolerant? Um, so here's the other big change that's happened in America over the last 50 years. The one big change I've described has gotten us more polarized, right? But the other big change is just as at the same time that we've been fighting more and more having culture wars in the public sphere, in our private lives, Americans have developed closer and closer personal relationships across faith boundaries. So that the, the, the clearest case that we know about this, because the data are good, going back a long ways, is in religious intermarriage, marrying someone from a different faith than yours. Um, and there has been a very, very rapid increase in, in interfaith marriages in America, um, not, especially in the last 50 years, but even going over the whole of the 20th century. So that at the end of the 20, at the beginning of the 21st century, of marriages today, more than half, more than half of all marriages in America today are interfaith marriages. So the, the marriage between um, Chelsea uh, Clinton and her, who was raised as a Methodist, and, and her new Jewish husband is completely normal now, utterly normal. And I assure you, 50, I can tell you more about this, but I assure you, 50 years ago, that, was any, that kind of marriage was anything but normal. It was completely abnormal for people to marry. I'll show you what the graph looks like, actually, if I've got it right here, I think. Uh, oh. Um, yeah, so the, the blue line are the fraction of all marriages from the 1920s to the 1990s, the fraction of all marriages where the partners originally came from different faiths. Um, and the, the yellow line are those, the fraction of all marriages where they, where they stayed in different faiths. So the difference between the blue line and the yellow line are where, where somebody converted and then they ended up in the same faith, but they came from different faiths is the, you see what the difference between the two lines are? And, and it's un, unambiguous that by now in the 1990s, more than half of all marriages, um, at least at the outset, were interfaith. It's, and, and then there's been some conversion. Um, but, and that actually does not count a in, in, um, uh, an evangelical marrying, uh, sorry, as a, it doesn't count a, um, a mainliner marrying another mainliner. That doesn't count as a change. That is, a Methodist marries a Lutheran. It doesn't get in here. These are only the big steps, right? So it's clear there's been a ton of intermarriage. Um, and that means many, many Americans, indeed nowadays, most Americans who are married are sleeping with someone in a different religion. Um, and it's a little hard to imagine the person you're sleeping with is condemned to hell. Why did you get married <laughs> if you thought that person was on their way to hell? Why? It's just hard to do. Um, and then secondly, related to but independent, independent of this intermarriage trend, there's been a big tr an increase in, in people, individual people shifting their own religions. So uh, between 30 and 40 percent of all Americans are now in a religion other than their own parents. 30 to 40 percent. If you count a Methodist who came from a Lutheran background, that kind of small difference, then the number is even higher. So I'm, I'm excluding those small difference changes. So 40 percent, 30 to 40 percent, a third say, of all Americans, it's partly, in, 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 it's partly because of interfaith marriages, but it's all, not. A lot of people just change their religion. That means a third of us are in a different religion from our own parents or from our own kids. So that's another personal tie across these lines. And among our, you can begin to think through what are the implications for our friendship networks. Friendship networks, because of this rapid change, means if you start off and you leave college and you have you, all of your friends, you know, 
your six closest friends, you all hug and you say, we're going to stay whatever we're going to be. We're going to stay Congregationalists, or we're going to stay Episcopalians, or we're going to stay Jews. The problem is you can't count on the other people. At least two of the other six, 20 years from now, are going to be something else. So even if you don't change your friends, they're changing. And so then you've got a friend who is a, whatever, Muslim or Mormon or, or Jew or something. You didn't start off with it. And in fact, if we ask, we ask people directly, tell us about your five closest personal friends, your go-to friends. Tell us about the people that you would go to if you discovered you had cancer or your marriage was falling apart. Some personal trauma. These are the people who you, these are your go-to friends. And then we went through each of them and said, okay, what religion is that person? What religion is that person? What religion is that person? And for the average American, half of their most intimate, dependable friends are in some other religion. So you sum that all up. And one way of putting it is, in personal terms, most Americans love someone who's in a different religion than them. I don't mean they just have, you know, it's not like this, God loves you all. Among their loved ones, is our, for the average American, almost all of us have people we love who are not in our faith. All of us have, we say in the book, and Aunt Susan. Aunt Susan, I, have I told you about my Aunt Susan? Aunt Susan is some faith other than mine, right? So I'm, I'm you think of your own Aunt Susan. Uh, Aunt Susan is Catholic and you're Jewish, or Aunt Susan is Jewish and you're Baptist, or Aunt Susan is Baptist and you're Unitarian, or Aunt Susan is Unitarian and you're God knows what, Muslim or something. And you know that poor Aunt Susan, she's not going to heaven because she's, you know, prayed to the wrong altar. But come on, you know Aunt Susan? Aunt Susan is made bound for heaven. If anyone's going to go to heaven, it's Aunt Susan. This Aunt Susan of mine and of yours is just a wonderful heaven bound. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to get to heaven, but Aunt Susan is. So then all of us, all of us in America are caught in this dilemma between what we say on Sunday morning, you know, only people who pray like I do are going to get to heaven, and Aunt Susan. Aunt Susan is a standing rebuke to that theological orthodoxy. And in that conflict, we can show you Aunt Susan almost always wins. And what that means is, as we've come to have friends and relatives and, and, uh, and wives and husbands who are in some other religion, it has become harder and harder to demonize those other religions. And we can see that in our own data because at, we can see, because we watch people twice. Remember, that's the point I was saying. We talk to the same people twice. As they get friends of another faith, they become more tolerant of all faiths. So you have this friend. It doesn't mean even you didn't have to go looking for an interfaith friendship. You, you're a beekeeper. You've got this friend in your beekeeping group. Al, Al is a terrific beekeeper. He tells you all he knows about beekeeping. You go out drinking after, afterwards. So it's terrific, Al, the beekeeper. And then one day you're talking, and it turns out Al is a Mormon. You can see our people in our survey thinking, well, I mean, Mormons, yeah, they're odd. But Al, Al, as I'm telling you, is the soul of the earth, right? He's terrific. So when they get Al, the Mormon friend, or Al, it doesn't matter what the religion is, Al, the Jewish friend, or Al, the evangelical friend, people, they become then more open about evangelicals or Mormons or Jews. It's not so surprising they become more open about Al's religion, because that would be a direct effect, but they also become more open about everybody's religion. It's, it's sort of a spillover effect. It's a very, it's hard to, I mean, technically, I'm not going to get, I'm not trying, trying not to be social science on you here, but technically it's hard to, the finding that we have is actually a quite striking finding, because it's not easy to be able to show the causal effect of getting a strange, a friend from a different re uh, religion. Um, okay, so, um, so I'm, I'm, I've gone over, and, I'm, I'm, and I don't have almost no time for the point about American religious people being nicer, but I'm going to just impose on you just a second to give you that. So the, is, the, is the big picture clear? Shock and two after shocks polarized. Uh, nevertheless, we're tolerant. How could that be? And Susan is the answer to the puzzle. Uh, because we all have many more, and there are many more Aunt Susans now than before. Um, so we, we also wanted to see, and I'm going to give you now the three or four minute version of this, uh, just to tantalize you and provoke you to the question, skeptical question. We asked people about a whole range of good things they could do for their community and neighbors and so on. Um, we ask, uh, how often do you volunteer? How often do you give to philanthropy? How often do you um, work on community projects? How often do you, you know, work, work in your community to uh, make political change, progressive political change? Um, how often do you give blood? How often do you help people across the street? How often do you, um, uh, give money to strangers, how, I mean, to panhandlers, how often do you uh, let people cut in front of you in line? Um, and on virtually every measure, 
religious people who are more religious are nicer. That is, their religious people are more likely to give to charity, and not just to put money in the church, uh, uh, in the in the um, collection plates, but also to give religious people give more to secular causes than non-religious people do. They are more likely to volunteer, a lot more likely to volunteer, and they're more likely to volunteer for secular causes, not just to be a church usher, but to also to work in, a, you know, do reading groups or whatever. Um, Religious people are more likely to give blood, more likely, everything I said, they're more likely to do, more likely to work on community projects, more likely, a little more likely to vote, more likely to be involved in social action, but not just more likely to be having a, a you know, a kind of a pro-life rally, but also to be more likely to, to be, ar be active in, say, protest marches for immigrants. Um, it's religious Americans, religious progressives, not secular progressives, who are the root of those of, the, of, that, of that progressive social movement. It's also true, of course, on the, on the right. Um, so by many, it is true in our data and in the book, we spend, more, we spend a fair amount of time showing that religious people are actually somewhat less tolerant of dissent than non-religious people. So religious people are slightly less likely, 10 percentage points, less likely to say that, you know, to defend civil liberties. Um, and so there, I don't want to say religious people are saints in civic terms, but, uh, but except for this issue, it's an important one, but except for the issue of, of tolerance of dissent, all the other measures of being a good citizen, taking care of your neighbors, paying attention to you know, less people who are less well off, uh, volunteering, putting your money where your mouth is, all those sorts of things, religious people are better neighbors and better citizens. So of course we thought, how come that is? Why is that? Why are religious people um, nicer, and I mean by nicer, I'm using that as a technical term, meaning more likely to volunteer and give and so on. And of course, some of our religious, there were members of our religious, of our team that were religious, and of course, the religious people are more likely to say, that's God's doing, God, is, and that may be right, I don't, I'm not a theologian, but I want to know how did God do it? Uh, that is, what is it, a, what's the mechanism by which religious people become nicer? And there are a lot of theological reasons why that should be true. You know, most religions preach something, some version of the golden rule. Um, people go to sermons and they listen to lots of sermons and maybe if many of those sermons say, you know, be nice. Um, maybe it's because religious people believe in God and think God wants them to be. Um, and the, maybe they really believe very firmly in God and think that their faith, their, their eternal faith is tied up with whether they're nice. So if they're not nice, they'll go to hell. And if they are nice, they'll get into heaven. Um, we thought there are a whole, a whole range of, of theological reasons why um, people who go to church or religious services should be uh, nicer. It turns out the effect of all of those factors that I've just described, theology, theological beliefs, and so on, is zero. That is to say, it doesn't matter whether you're a really firm believer in God or not. It doesn't matter whether you believe in justification by deeds versus justification by faith. It doesn't matter whether you believe in a loving God or a judgmental God or whatever. What matters is do you go to church? Period. So if you go to church, even if you, you, know, you get to church and you're actually kind of you know, not all that convinced that there is a God, but if you go to church, you're, you're going to be just as nice as a secular person. And if you don't go to church, but really believe firmly in God, you're not all that nice. It is say, none of those theological beliefs independent of going to church. So what is it about going to church that matters? And we pressed further, and it turns out we did find the secret ingredient. It is what we call church friends. The more friends you have at church, the nicer you are. So if you are involved, if you go to church suppers and church socials and so on, reading groups and prayer groups and so on, you're really much more likely to be neighborly, regardless of your theological beliefs. And conversely, if you don't, if you sit in the pews, you're deeply devout, you're unbelievably devout, you believe in that God who's about to strike you dead at any moment, and you pray constantly, but you do it alone, that is, you don't have any other friends at church, from a civic point of view, you look just like a secular person. That is, all your devoutness itself doesn't matter. Conversely, if you do have friends at church, but you're not very religious, I mean, you may not even believe in God. Now, you say, well, how could you, how could you have friends at church if you don't believe in God? The answer is, if you go to church suppers because of your wife or your spouse, right? So you get dragged there. So you happen to have some friends at church, even though you're actually pretty unreligious yourself, you look, in, statistic, in statistical terms, just like the most religious person. It's the church friends and not the theology that turns out to produce this. Now, why? And having friends in general is good for your civic. People who have friends in general are, are nicer. Um, 
But church friends are supercharged. That is, they make a bigger difference <laughs> in your, so now why is that? I mean, we don't know quite why that is, and we're, this is actually the frontier of our own research. I don't, and I'm happy to take advice about that, but I can summarize, this is the last sentence of the talk, um, where we've gotten to. If you've read Bowling Alone, you know that the punchline of Bowling Alone is, um, in terms of life satisfaction, happiness, contributions to the community, all good things, people who bowl in leagues are better than people who bowl alone. They're more happier and so on. And the, the punchline of this book is, ah, yes, but church bowling leagues, that's the way to go. <laughs> Thank you all very much for your time. much and we have just a few minutes let me throw it open um, and ask you to direct a question um, just one question to the speaker and could you identify yourself by way of introducing yourself let's see shall anyone over here and um, yes go ahead keep, and if you could keep it brief yes please um, I'm an aunt Susan by the way oh good <laughs> um, I think theology might be relevant in the, in the sense that some um, well, most religions have a theory of community worshiping and practicing religion in community. Yeah. But that takes different effect according to which denomination you are. Yes. Um, my Episcopal parish is full of Catholics, and as you will know, having looked at the Episcopal Church, a lot of those two-thirds who are now no longer right. Catholics like their parents have migrated to various Protestant faiths. Right. One of the reasons they say that they come to the Episcopal Church is that it has a much stronger church community yeah. than they knew before. Yeah. So, um, and that I think also spills over into the progressive political anomaly that you that you alluded right. to in the first part. Right. Does, is your model sensitive enough to take account of those kind of cross countercurrents? Well, um, uh, yes, it's a really good question. And, uh, and of course, you're right about describing what's happening. Catholics, some Catholics, ex-Catholics end up as Episcopalians, as you say. Um, it isn't, I think, quite right to say that it's the theology, though, that is making them nicer. Because we know from our data that if they could, be they could believe whatever theology they want, it's the practice. Do they actually have friends at, at church? And it turns out denomination makes zero difference. Zero difference. If you've got friends at church, it do, or in your, in your congregation, it doesn't matter what that denomination is. The, the data look exactly the same for Jews and Evangelicals and Baptists and Methodists and Episcopalians and Catholics and whatever. Denomination makes zero difference. What matters is how many friends do you have at church? Now, it's true that some denominations have different, there are different degrees of connectedness. Mormons, for example, are the most connected. Mormons are way more likely to say they have friends at church than most other religious traditions. And that's not unrelated to the fact that Mormons actually, on all these measures, are, are better neighbors and, and more do-gooding. Not just within the Mormon community, but outside the Mormon community. I'm not trying to convert you here to that. I'm just trying to say that. But it, it's not that the Mormonism itself directly, it's not the theology of Mormonism that has that effect, or of Catholic Catholicism or whatever. As far as we can tell, the theology makes no difference at all. What matters is, what's the practice? Is there, in fact, a community of Christ in the body of Christ? In the, if there is, then it, from, from the point of view I'm talking, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm not a theologian, so maybe it turns out it does matter, the theology does matter to whether you actually empirically are going to get saved. I mean, I can't say that, but I can say it does not have any effect on, on how good a citizen or a neighbor you are. Is that making sense? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, my question is that in, in terms of the international political situation, you said that uh, the, pol the politics have uh, some influence to religion. Uh, so yes. uh, from 1990, uh, the people who have no religion, uh, the number of such kind of people increased. Yes. But, uh, for example, the end of Cold War or yeah. other factors of pol international political situation have some influence. Change the situation in India, or is that uh, just a domestic uh, matter? I mean, 
It's a good question, and I can see why from outside you might think that it has something to do with international relations, but the best of our evidence is it has nothing to do with international relations. We ask a lot of questions about people, including we ask their views about international relations. Um, and none of those things predict which people became young nuns. The thing that most strongly predicts whether people became a young nun is how they feel about homosexuality. If you're in your 20s and you think homosexuality is okay, you are very likely to leave the church. And if you think that homosexuality is bad, you're very likely not to leave the church. And that is the best single predictor. The others have to do with domestic American political views. If you're, if you're in general left wing, you tended to have left the church if you're young. And if you're right wing, you tended not to have left the church. Views on international affairs, um, so far as we can tell, have zero effect. So it's not like people, these are the internationalists or the nationalists or the you know, isolationists or whatever that are leaving the church. It just doesn't. People are making these decisions about whether to go to church or not, not really based on the international situation. Can I follow up, Bill, on, and uh, bring this to the 1960s? Because what you described is really an earthquake, an extraordinary change of values in a very short amount of time. And it's actually amazing from the social science perspective, because social scientists regularly try to predict the future, and they do straight line projections sure. of what they're experiencing now. But had we done that in the 50s, we could never have imagined the changes you described in the 60s. How do you yourself account for this kind of change that occurred in such a short time in the United States? And do you see it sort of in an Engelhardt-like way across the industrial countries taking a particular form in the US, or do you see it as a, an American story? Well, uh, it's a really good question, Susan. And I, I, and I now appreciate how much how I now better appreciate how important the question is because you can see how the effect it had across American life, American society, and enduring effects because they were embedded in people's generational views. Um, uh, it was an earthquake. I have to say the uh, second aftershock, this period in the 1990s, is actually ha is having a, is a bigger deal with respect to religion than the first aftershock of the 60s. The 60s was important because it changed so much of, of the rest. I mean, it changed our gender roles, it changed our economy, it changed our, I mean, it changed everything. The second aftershock is basically changing our religion. But if you look only at religion, more people are being affected by the second aftershock than by the first aftershock, by the first shock and the first earthquake. Um, why the 60s happened is an interesting question, but it's a different question than I can answer. I mean, it's a, it, you know, it's, it's a, you have views and I have views as, as, as people, I'm sure we do. Um, I th myself think the most important thing about the 60s was that um, because of the baby boom generation, there was suddenly a huge increase in the number, in the ratio, in the amount of adult supervision. Um, so there just had to be less adult supervision in the, in the 50s and 60s because of the baby boom and therefore these were kids who were raised less under, the, more under their own influence from one another, peer influence became more important and less under the influence of adult teachers or whatever. And I, that's, there are other theories, um, as you very well know, Ron Engelhardt is probably my old, oldest personal colleague. I taught my very first class in life with Ron and I, we know each other extremely well and I think the world of his work. But I don't think that the simple um, uh, notion that it was plenty, that is, uh, that a world of plenty transformed America does, um, does adequate justice because we had growing plenty in the, in the 80s and in the 90s. Those were both periods of great growth in American plenty and it wasn't producing this enormous shock that, you know, of, of uh, liberation and, <coughs> and, and so on. I don't deny that there's something to the post-imperialist argument of Ron, but I I don't, actually, I don't think that it's the most important single answer. I think it's part of the story. Probably there are other things, too, um, that, that caused it. Um, and, you know, there was a sort of worldwide contagion. Of, you know, 1968 was a year in which there was worldwide contagion. But it was driven, actually, the one thing that was true in all these societies was there was a post-war baby boom. Therefore, there was a change in the ratio of adult supervision. And I, I'm not saying that the young people were wrong. I might say they were less repressed than an earlier generation by adult views, but that, I think, enabled there to be this, youth, this very rapidly developing youth culture. I think the baby boomers have been really, they've disrupted lots of things in their whole lives. They're gonna disrupt 
gerontocracy, gerontology, you know, in the next 20 years. Well, on that note, I'm terribly sorry, but we are at the end of our time, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming today and thank Bob Putnam for a terrific presentation. By the way, I <laughs>